Hello again, I am Blunty. This may just be the ugliest PC I have ever built. Uh, basically because it has to be temporary because most of the parts in here were parts that came with the AMD Ryzen Threadripper uh, review sample chips. Uh, so the cooler and the power supply and the motherboard and of course the chips and the RAM uh, all came in the reviewers kit. So uh, unfortunately Australia not particularly dense with tech reviewers. There aren't that many Threadripper review kits to go around. So instead of getting a you know customized uh, uh, version of it like some other of the North American reviewers got with that little sort of collectible laser engraved Ryzen chip and its little perspex housing and everything. M mine was blank without my name because I have to shift this on to someone else. Tear. I, I, I don't even know whether I want to show you the back of this rig because I, 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 I take pride in my cable management and there just is no cable management. I mean, you can see it, all this crap down here. There's just no attention paid to cable management. The back is even worse. You know, I think I'll show you for prosperity's sake. Uh, there has to be some evidence kept of the slapdash job I did of throwing this thing together. I wonder if that's going to make my life more difficult when it comes to pulling it apart again. Probably. So because I've had such a limited time with it, I've decided to sort of focus in my efforts on my review. If you want sort of a full and complete breakdown with lots of boring charts and bar graphs and, and pie charts and... Lots of lots of numbers to, to read and things like that. I'm sure there'll be plenty of other people doing that kind of very, very dry, but very, very, you know, technically specific kind of coverage of Threadripper. You won't be we won't be you won't be lost for choice when it comes to that sort of stuff. I decided to sort of I'm gonna throw a few sort of artificial benchmarks out just to sort of get an idea of where things sit, but then I'm gonna throw some real world uh, you know, workloads at it, specifically in my particular wheelhouse of being a YouTuber, gamer, streamer kind of guy. So you're going to see me running a AAA title that I know to be an absolute CPU bitch. I'm going to run OBS. I'm going to stream at 1080, 60 frames per second. I'm going to record it, and I'm going to use Handbrake to encode a video in the background. And, spoiler alert, guess what? It works. Really well. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. If you are a content creator, if you are a serious Twitch streamer, if you are a YouTuber who focuses a lot on gaming-type content... You are going to want to think fairly heavily about your next build and whether or not you want to invest in a Ryzen Threadripper because it is a, uh, spoiler alert, significant advantage over an i7, for example. And yes, I know the Threadrippers aren't direct competitors to the i7, it's just that the i7 tends to be the common choice when it comes to YouTubers and streamers and things like that because, well, the i7s are quite good. This, it's way better. Way better. Because Threadripper has a butt-ton of CPU cores and, of course, twice as many threads, I didn't really bother starting from a low point and working my way up like I did with the Ryzen 3s when I tried similar tests. So with my first test here, I just went right for hard mode, starting with the lesser of the two Threadrippers, the 1920X, which has 12 core and 24 thread setup. I set OBS up for a 1080p 60 frames per second stream at the maximum allowable bitrate for Twitch and a locally saved video file under the indistinguishable large file size settings. Using software X264 encoding because that works better at the lower bitrates Twitch wants than the hardware encoder on the GTX 1080 I was using for example. So while the GPU encoding would have been more efficient, yes, the stream would look worse. And let's face it, if you're running a Threadripper system, it's safe to bet you're after the best. So I kicked up Overwatch into maxed out ultra settings and as you've been seeing the game runs well over 150 frames per second while OBS is encoding the stream recording with barely 12% of the CPU resources. I did notice that for some reason I frustratingly wasn't able to quite pin down in the extremely limited time I had with the system. While neither OBS nor Overwatch or anything else I asked of the system were using anywhere near the full capacity available, OBS still occasionally dropped the stream output to the mid 50 frames per seconds. So there's a bottleneck here somewhere, but it's not the CPU. The same test with OBS locked to 1080p 30 frames per second, which at the kinds of bitrates you're looking at for Twitch will give you a better looking stream anyway, thanks to the cleaner compression, ran like butter on the surface of Mercury's bright side. And of course, at this point, it goes without saying that asking the 1920X for a 720p 60 frames per second stream, by far and away the most common and preferred setting for most streamers out there, it is a complete walk in the park. But that's really just the warm-up 
Overwatch is fantastically well built, but now it's time to flip the coin and find Watch Dogs 2, one of the most CPU-soaking games of recent times. This thing is just a dog when it comes to trying to stream it from the same system it's running on. But, as you may hope considering my praise in the intro, yeah, it actually handles it without a problem. The 1080p 30 frames per second setup kept up flawlessly and still kept the game feeding out at 60 to 80 frames per second. On the 1080p 60 frames per second stream recording test, I saw the same odd bottleneck in OBS not quite gluing itself to 60 frames per second output despite not using all of the CPU resources that were on hand. I even used Task Manager to wall off some of the cores for the game and the others for OBS and no change. But you can clearly see there is plenty of CPU capacity here, so if I had the time to sort out this odd little glitch, there's no doubt that OBS would be nailed to 60 frames per second and the game itself, as you can see, zero frame rate issues. Oddly enough, when I tried to kick the Threadripper's teeth in by asking it for a 720p 60 frames per second stream recording and run this pig of a game at utterly maxed out settings and use Handbrake to encode a gigabyte sized 1080p 60 frames per second video file down to 1080p 30 frames per second presets, a workload not out of the question for a YouTuber and streamer to want to be able to do simultaneously to save them a bunch of time, for example, being able to run a stream while simultaneously preparing a batch of videos for YouTube to upload or archiving, there was almost no difference to the easier test. The game now occasionally drops below 60 frames per second, which is still acceptable gameplay-wise for a game like this, while the video render pops along reliably and OBS actually performing slightly better somehow, keeping the 60 frames per second output stable. The real key to getting this kind of workload stable, by the way, is using Windows Task Manager's ability to set CPU affinity, that is, to manually assign CPU threads and cores to specific programs so nothing overruns the whole CPU. For example, with a 1920X's 24 threads, you can give Handbrake, the game, and OBS each eight threads of their very own. It's a bit like having each app get a four-core eight-thread CPU all to itself, really. And that is the secret power of Threadripper's massive threaded design when it comes to multitasking, or indeed mega-tasking, as the marketers would have you jabbering about. The big boy chip, the 1950X, has a very similar story, but with 16 cores and 32 threads, there's even more to share around. The results are actually very similar in most tests, but you've got the basic equivalent of one more 4-core 8-thread CPU to splash around. And I really do wish I had more time to run these tests, as clearly by looking at the CPU loads, there's more tweaking I could be doing to maximize efficiency and nail everything to the absolute wall. But let me send this message home and show you what my own i7-7700K does under the same ask. Same game, same settings, same handbrake encode, and with fewer threads to work with, of course. OBS and handbrake are manually limited to two threads each, the rest needed to keep the game running properly. Anything less, and the game just bogs down too much. As you can see, you can just get away with this workload on the i7, but every thread is pegged. There's no overhead room at all like there is on Threadripper, and worse, while OBS seems to be keeping up as far as the frame rate goes, the stream recording itself reveals rather dramatically that it's overwhelmed with stutters and judders and massive amounts of dropped frames. Basically, I would consider the stream output unwatchable. And while it's true that in pure gameplay performance, Intel still has an edge, it's forward-looking gear like Threadripper that is the path to be on. And remember, these tests were just the beginning. You fold into that overlays and webcams and chat panels and a browser window so you can keep an eye on your own stream feed at the viewing end and, say, a music player and any number of little things and apps and bits and pieces and support apps. And Threadripper does nothing but make sense. AMD haven't really nuked Intel from orbit, but this is the world's biggest wake-up slap, and you can already see Intel starting to hit the panic button. Keep an eye on what they're doing. So Threadripper is unquestionably a superb choice for mega-tasking YouTubers and streamers and gamers. Coming up next, though, let's take a look at the benchmarks and pure gameplay and see what's what when you're not going ham on the streaming and video encoding side of things. The Cinebench test, a workload that heavily leverages multi-threaded performance, shows AMD's 1920X blowing Intel right out of the arena, rather dramatically too, not by a small margin. And the 1950X blows that away by a big fat chunk too. It's an amazing number. 
The single core performance under Geekbench 3 is somewhere just under my 7700K Intel on both chips, but again, of course, it is the multi-core performance that hammers home the central difference here. The PC Mark 10 score, a benchmark that tries to simulate a more general day-to-day -day computing experience, but not particularly in multitasking, shows again Intel with stronger single-core performance, helping it beat out the 1920X, but not the 1950X. One of the specific requests I had from you guys to try was this production benchmarking render with Blender. Not a program I have any familiarity with, but the setup and test is simple enough. Time to render on the 1920X was about 37 minutes, the 1950X beat that score by about 10 minutes, and my 7700K, well, <laughs> that took an hour and 15 for the same workload. Twice as long as a 1920X and almost three times as long as the 1950X. And again, I know, I know the 7700K is not a fair comparison against the Threadripper chips. They serve different parts of the market and the 7700K is about half the price of the 1950X. But the reason I'm doing these comparisons is because one, the i7 is a common recommendation to those running multitask heavy workloads like the streaming test I showed you earlier. And two, the 7700K is what I use myself. It's what I have here in my own machine, and it makes a great common comparison point. Like when you compare stuff to the size of a bread box or, or a football field or something. Everyone knows what to expect when you frame it like that. The CPU benchmark in Ashes of the Singularity brought in 41.7 FPS on the 1920X and 46.1 for the 1950, compared to the 38.5 from my 7700K. Doom, a game not especially dependent on the CPU, reached triple digit frame rates when completely maxed out and stayed, of course, deeper in them on the bigger chip. We got a very similar result from GTA 5 and a barely noticeable difference between the 1920X and 1950X as, what will happen with many games, with so many threads to spare, your bottleneck moves elsewhere in the system. Which means, as I showed you earlier, you can max out your games to their ultimate potential and still have leftover CPU time for other stuff. 130 to 160 frames per second in project cars, again a barely noticeable difference in real world performance between the two CPUs, and Watch Dogs 2, this time unhindered by OBS and handbroken codes and the like, well, entirely maxed out, it too hits the GPU wall before it hits the CPU wall. With frame rates basically identical to when we were running those streaming tests with all that extra workload going on. And finally, Overwatch wanted to reach into the 200 frames per second town for some fun times there. Just on the note of cooling performance, it actually stayed remarkably cool as well. Even when I was doing that overclocking, it was just sort of 30, 40, 50, maybe 70 degrees Celsius at the absolute max when I'm just kicking the absolute hell out of it with a blender render or something like that. Um, so the Thermaltake um, Flow Ring 360 TT Special Edition, or I'll put the full name of the cooler up on the screen. Um, this is a, uh, an AM4 cooler, not a TR4 cooler, but of course Threadrippers come with that adapter bracket, which means you can use AM4 coolers or certain water coolers with the um, water block of a certain type um, with Threadripper. But Thermaltake also are coming out uh, with bespoke Threadripper specific TR4 mounted options as well. But just so you know, the uh, 360 cooler right here, more than enough to keep even an overclocked Threadripper under control. I was really quite amazed by it. I mean, I shouldn't have been super amazed by it because in my own system, again, I'll try and tilt this thing back. In my own system back there, you know, the, the cooling system back there, that's all that's all thermal take stuff. The radiator, the fans, the tubing, the coolant, the, uh, you know, connections and all that sort of, it's, it's you know, that, that's all thermal take through and through. So I already know they make good gear, but they're all in one. Um, performed remarkably well, much better than I was expecting, especially sitting on top of what you would assume <laughs> to be a, a toasty toasty chip, but it's just not. It's so well behaved. Um, I don't think I even had the fans ever spin up to 100% to try to keep things under control as well, so you can manage to keep this thing quiet as well. So as expected, a Threadripper, while it will let your games loose, if all you're doing is single task gaming, your money probably is better spent on a Ryzen 7, perhaps even a Ryzen 5 for that matter, and you can move your system build budget around to max out your GPU and memory capacity and speed, both of which are going to have bigger benefits for game performance than a Threadripper chip will, all else being equal. But 
there's no escaping the fact that with so much headroom, you can get a lot else done while you're gaming. So when you're waiting for a big video edit to render or convert or whatever, or you've got some other CPU intensive tasks running like Blender, the kind of stuff that would normally just tie up your PC, making it slow to useless for anything else, the Blender test, for example, on my 7700K almost locked the system up. Even the mouse wasn't really responding very smoothly. But on Threadripper, now you can let it do its thing and just go ahead and run a full AAA game over the top of it. Even stream to Twitch at the same time or whatever. It's crazy to actually just be able to do that stuff. I've spent over a decade watching video render time bars chunk away, swallowing up so much CPU time that even doing something simple like editing a thumbnail image for the video is a significantly slower and chuggier experience. Threadripper is the solution to keeping you productive, letting you get crap done without the computationally greedy stuff slowing your other work down. And if you subscribe to the old adage that time is money, then it becomes much easier to justify the high-end price for these high-end components. They keep you more productive. And this, by the way, is just day one. This is before the ripple that AMD's thread festooned CPUs have started flows through the industry at large, and more and more workloads and games are fine-tuned to take even better advantage of the massively multi-threaded processing nature of chips like this. This stuff is only going to get faster, smoother, more seamless, and I'm pretty friggin' excited by that. A Threadripper CPU is not for everyone, and no one should be claiming it is, and no one should be expecting it to be. This is high-end desktop stuff. But it is one of those products that if it suits your needs, your workloads, and your workflows, it's going to be a very meaningful investment, and it is going to make a very meaningful impact on the way you get stuff done. So there you go. What do you think? I mean... You heard me gush all video long, I'm sure. I haven't actually written that part of the video yet. I'm just recording the outro now, but I have an idea about the kind of stuff I'm going to say. <laughs> I want one. I seriously, seriously want one. I'm, I mean, actually, no, you know what? Not want, need. I need one of these to make my life as a gamer, streamer, YouTuber, mesh together, ball content creator kind of person, creature, thing, Faster, easier, simpler, because this can do things that, uh, as I showed you, try and disrupt not to knock out my drink. This can do things that 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 just can't. That's a badass machine back there, bad ass rig right back there. This monsters it in just an embarrassing way. So thanks for watching. I am Blunty. We'll catch you next time. Um, coming up down the road, there will be more Ryzen Threadripper stuff. I, like I said, I have to send this this you know whole kit back uh, and both chips back, but I should be getting one again to sort of build up my own system based around an MSI board and everything that I teased about in in tweets. The MSI stuff didn't arrive in time, which is why I built the system like this. Thanks for watching. I am Blunty. We'll catch you next time. I think I already said that. Say it again.